invite you to turn to the book of Psalms as we continue to go. Uh, I've told you I'm not going to go through 150 Psalms in a row, but we have been going in a row lately because I, uh, I've seen so much in these early uh, short Psalms of David. And uh, we come to another one of those Psalms, a Psalm, uh, again, a Psalm of lament or complaint, uh, again, a, a, a lament about David's enemies. And uh, Psalm 3, you might recall, we're told that title at the beginning of, of the psalm that, that it was during the time of David's uh, son Absalom's rebellion, uh, the military coup against his father, uh, that that psalm uh, comes out of. And uh, David emphasizes his many foes there that want to take away his life. And then Psalm 4, David is still distressed, David is still um, constricted, we see that word constricted again by his foes, who this time want to take away his reputation. And he was being falsely accused. And that the focus of Psalm 4 was upon that as it uh, is uh, given. And then now Psalm 5, David goes to greater depth and, to, and into greater detail about his many enemies as he cries out to the Lord. And the song begins with David's groaning it ends with rejoicing. The psalm begins with a prayer for himself. It ends with a prayer for God's people, for God's church. In fact, the whole psalm is a prayer. And this is the first psalm that is like that, that the whole thing is a prayer. Uh, there's no uh, pauses for wisdom statements. All is said to God. And, it's, uh, and Psalm 5 also is another morning prayer. You'll notice that the time is given of mourning uh, as opposed to evening. Remember, we saw that in Psalm 3, it was a, a morning prayer. And then in Psalm 4, an evening prayer. And now Psalm 5, back to a morning prayer again. Uh, this psalm was used in the temple worship, the daily temple worship, when Jesus went into the temple. It was Psalm 5 that was read on a daily basis. Um, psalm 5 has these five verses. There are five sections to it. Each of them makes a significant point in his seeking after God and being steady in his Lord when evil is all around him. And so hear the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord from uh, Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. Morning by morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. Morning by morning, I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men the Lord abhors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. In reverence I will bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongue they speak deceit. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who rejoice, re take refuge in you, be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as with a shield. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you and give you praise that you have given us this word, this prayer for this time. We ask that you would now, by your spirit, work. We ask by your spirit that you would 
have your people hear your word and listen to your voice through your word uh, wherever they are. And Lord, we ask that you now help us as we are surrounded by evil. May we take from this what you want us to have. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever been a victim of a crime, or you've ever been bullied at school, or you've ever been abused at home, or you've ever watched the news after a terrorist attack or a school shooting, then you know what David felt when he wrote Psalm 5. For ever since Adam's fatal choice, evil is not only here around us every day, but at times it can draw in close around us. At times it can overwhelm us of the evil that is in the world. And it was overwhelming David when he wrote this psalm. How are we today, where we live, to respond to evil? Well, I believe Psalm 5 tells us how to do that. I think it's written by the Spirit of God for that very purpose. I picked up a little book this week um, called More Psalms for all seasons. Back in 1975, a guy by the name of David Hubbard, who was the president of Fuller Seminary in the good old days of Fuller uh, there. He was Old Testament professor as well. And he found what I found in this psalm. It touched my heart. He says, our attitudes are mixed as we watch the wickedness around us. Uh, a fear of being hurt, a desire to retaliate, a temptation to imitate, at different times and in various situations, these attitudes churn within us. When opposition heats up, when ungodly people seem to be gaining ground, when wickedness looks like it's a winner, the psalmist advice in Psalm 5 is what we need. David was face to face with evil, with evil men. We're told about them all the way through the psalm. They are arrogant, they are deceitful, they are bloodthirsty men. They cannot be trusted. Their heart is filled with ways of destroying the kingdom of God. And what are, they, what are we supposed to do when we confront such evil? What are we supposed to do when we, we encounter such, such men? You know, I watched, uh, I, I'm a sucker for a, a good Western. And since they're not too many good westerns, I'm fooled every time. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, I watched a western this week. In fact, I got Gail, my wife, to watch it with me. And we watched this western. And at one point, the father of the main character is telling his son what to do. He says, you're out there in the world, you're going to meet evil men. And when you meet evil men, you've got to strike fast and you've got to strike first. And later in the, the, the movie... Uh, he meets an evil man who's ready to gun him down. And he thinks fast and he picks up a pool ball and throws it at the man and knocks him down and takes away his gun. It's a good Western, a good Western. But this is not what David gives as advice. He doesn't say strike. He doesn't say strike first or strike hard and fast. This is not the advice that he gives us as he goes through the experience of encountering evil face to face. What does he do? There's five things he does. I want you to see them. They're, they're the five sections, the five verses of the psalm. The first thing, what does he do in verses one through three? He prays. He go, goes to God. David calls upon the name of the Lord, his Lord, his King. David says it six times in six different ways. Give ear, number one. Consider, number two. Listen to my cry for help, number three. I pray, number four. Hear my voice, number five. I lay my requests before you. He says it a number of ways. And look at what you say. Some people have called this, a, these first three verses, a, a, a tutorial on prayer. There's so much of it in, so much about prayer in it. First of all, how does he pray? He prays with both words and sighing. Did you notice that? 
Prayer is not just our feelings and coming to God with our feelings. God wants us to articulate those feelings in words. God wants us to talk to him. He wants us to speak to him. And that's why it's helpful sometimes to speak out loud in prayer when you're by yourself. Don't just think it in your mind. Say it with your words. And these words that are spoken by God's people are heard by God. They're they're spoken, as one person put it this week, it's spoken into the ear of God. They don't just go out into space. They just don't go out someplace else. They go into the very ear of our heavenly Father. Use words in prayer. Secondly, prayer is also feelings felt in his presence. We don't negate the fact that it's feelings, but it's just not only that. We need to use words, but at times, David here is asking God to consider his sign, not just to put up with his sign, not just to to listen to his sign, but to consider the sign, the, the, the deep inner feelings that he's having as he comes before the Lord. He's asking God to, to listen to his sign. The word means groaning or murmuring. It comes from the word in Hebrew for burning. In Psalm 39.3, the psalmist says, My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated, the fire burned. And then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, O Lord, my life's end. He bring, out of this burning comes his prayer of words. We remind, this reminds us of Romans, isn't it? Romans 8 where it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to, we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. We don't know how to say it sometimes in prayer. We don't know what to say at times. All we can do sometimes is just sigh, just groan before the Lord. And then the Spirit of God takes those groans. Did you hear this? And he groans with us. And he groans for us. And he takes up our feelings and he makes them his own in prayer. And so prayer is both, as we're confronted by evil men or any time in prayer, it's both words and feelings. And God will listen to your groans, Christian. You need to go to him with those things. You need not to to go to someone else or to go to uh, take your mind off it. You need to go to him when you can only groan, when you can only sigh, when you can only wonder what this world is coming to with all the evil around it. Go to God with your feelings. In fact, prayer is one of the only places you can go and talk about yourself and not be selfish. God wants you to come. Did you notice the pronouns there? My words, my sign, my cry, my voice, my request. God wants you to come with your sign and with your words and with your crying. Part of prayer is truly speaking about your needs and your pain and your desires and your fears to your king and to your God. But notice one third thing about prayer in these early verses. David is not shy about coming to the Lord. Morning by morning, it's mentioned twice, morning by morning, day by day, David sees himself like a priest. This word requests in the NIV in verse 3 is a word that was used for the priests as they laid out and arranged the sacrifices uh, day by day. It's mentioned in Leviticus uh, 1 and, and Leviticus 24. It's, this is the word he takes it. And I think what David is saying, he sees himself like a priest before God in praying. And, and, and he can't stop, just like the priest can't stop doing the daily sacrifices, he can't stop praying. He continues to pray. And this is what we're to do. We're not to stop praying, ever. Now, how, how bad we feel, no matter how bad it is out there. We're to continue day by day, morning by morning, 
praying. It's not so much a point of saying you have to pray in the morning as opposed to the evening. We know that prayers were done at all times. But the point is that we pray daily. We go to the God and we pour out our feelings and our needs and our concerns. And David is expecting as he goes. This is the fourth thing. He's expecting an answer. David is, is not just thinking prayer is some kind of therapeutic thing that we do and it's an end unto itself. No, it's going somewhere. It's doing something. Something beyond us. Something to fight evil. Something to, to preserve our lives in the midst of evil. I, yesterday I read a, a quote it's, uh, that someone said that, that prayer is rebellion against the world's status quo. It's a tool, we're told in Ephesians 6, of spiritual warfare where we're combating the evil around us. And David says in the midst of that, literally, I look up. I expect like a prophet would look up from the, the, the tower that he was on, the watchtower he was on. It's the same word used for that. That David was looking for God's answer to the evil that he was facing. Well, that was a, a long first point. That's the first point, one, two, three. But we'll be quicker throughout, throughout it. Look at the, the second section. David is pressing his point with God for help and for help against evil men. And so David's starting to make an argument here. He's starting to make an argument to God and from God in this first point. He's, he's, he's arguing from God's character here. He says, you are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. Literally, for you are not a God enjoying wickedness. That's what it literally says. You're not a God who enjoys wickedness. God allows evil, yes, but he does not love evil. He does not do evil. He abhors evil. God, God never invites evil over for dinner. That's what he's saying here. God never lets evil stand before him and not judge it. And then it says these shocking words. God hates all who do evil. Well, we all do evil. Does that mean God hates everybody? You might say, wow, that's, that's something. I thought God hates the sin and loves the sinner. Isn't that what we always tell each other? But here, God says he hates both the sin and the sinner. Before you respond to that, remember that God's hatred of sin and the sinner is not like our hatred of sin and the sinner. Our, God's hatred is a holy hatred. Our, our hatred has got all kinds of impurities in it. All kinds of sins mixed up, mixed motives, bad motives, are all mixed up in our hatred of evil. But God's hatred is a perfect hatred. Can you imagine that? A justified hatred. God hates both the sin and the sinner. I remember years ago someone saying to me, if God uh, just hated the sin and not the sinner, then why doesn't he send the sin, sin to hell? Why does he send the sinner to hell? You see, they're connected, aren't they? And this should shock us. It should shock us into seeing that there is, there is no way ever to stand before God as a sinner by yourself, in your own righteousness, in your own self. Unless we have a, an advocate, unless we have an atonement made, unless we have Jesus, that's the only way we can stand before the Lord. But look at what this doesn't say. God hates the sin and the sinner. It doesn't say that that God only hates the sin and the sinner. God also loves sinners, we're told in Scripture. God is, is this and he's more than this. God can love those he hates. He, God reaches out to those who will never reach out to him. 
God loves the unlovable. God loves the despicable. God loves uh, whom, whom he abhors. And if you think, well, this is kind of schizophrenic, this is kind of strange, this, this is the scripture, this is what God tells us, that God loves who he hates in order to save who he loves. God loves who he hates enough to become one of us in Jesus. God loves sin and sinners enough to become sin for us in Jesus, to hang on a cross for us. And so the enemies become God's friends. And David is using this point, not about God's love here, but about God's hatred of sin, to plead with God to help him against evil in his life. One person put it this way, what holy, praiseworthy hatred this is of God's. Do you not pray? You do not pray to a bland blob. Yahweh has a certain character and because David knows that character, knows that Yahweh loves and what he loves and, and what he hates, he has real hope that God will come to his rescue. We pray against evil, first of all, because we know that God hates it. That God hates it. And David, thirdly, here in the third section, David not only remembers who God is or who God is not, but he remembers who he is. And that's where he turns here uh, in, in verse 7 and 8. In verse 7, he contrasts, but I, I am different from the wicked. I can, I can go and will go into God's temple. Notice how he uses the temple before the temple was made. This is David. David didn't build the temple. Temple wasn't built until after David. That's why some people say, well, David can't write it. No, he could write it because he was thinking in terms of prayer being like a temple, coming into the very presence of God. And he says, I can stand in God's presence. They can't. They can't approach. They can't dwell, but I can. Now, why can he say this? Why can David, David say this? How, how can he say this? Well, look at carefully at verse 7. By your great mercy... Literally, by your hesed, that's the Hebrew word for loving kindness or covenantal love, by your grace alone, I can stand in your presence. One person put it this way, what, what separates us from sinners, however, is not our righteousness, but his mercy. And because of this covenantal love, because of this hesed, because of this unconditional love, David prays that the Lord will lead him and guide him and through this crisis, that he'll lead him through the, the difficulty of living amongst evil enemies. And he prays that the Lord will make a straight way for him and let us take off the obstacles in the way, make the, the road travelable for him. But notice it's not just any way he prays for. He prays for God's way. It's the way of God's righteousness. It's the way of holiness that he prays for. And that's why he prays for this because he's surrounded by evil. And the temptation when we're surrounded by evil is to start to be evil ourselves and start to imitate it. And when we're faced with evil, we can, we can think that it's okay to, to use its weapons or its ways we can think that, that it's all right to, to shave a little bit off the truth. We can think it's all right uh, with a little pride for what we have done, with a little, little evil pleasure now and then. A little, a little revenge can creep in. And he's saying, no, put me on the righteous way, Lord. Put me on the path where I won't do that. Don't let me become like my enemies, is what David is saying. Leave me in your righteousness. Don't let me compromise. Don't let me drift. Don't let me get off course. And we need to pray the same thing. That we don't act like our enemies. That we don't act out the evil that we see around us. That we pray that God would put us on a righteous way in all that we do. Look fourthly at how to confront evil. We saw prayer. We saw that the God is not evil. Um, we've seen that, that, 
Now, David is different. We are different from the wicked around us. Look at verse 9 and 10. Here David gets to the very heart of the matter. Here David uh, gets to, to what he's been groaning about and what he's asking God for help for. David gives his third part of his argument for God's help here. In the first section, this first section he prays, and the second section he says, you're not evil and therefore help me through this evil. Don't allow it to happen. And then he says in the second section, I'm not part of the wicked and so lead me through this. And now bluntly he says, the evil has to go. He prays against evil here and evil ones. Evil ones, he's really saying, evil ones deserve to be banished. They deserve to be judged. They deserve to be stopped. Why? Because they, you can't believe anything they say. Because their heart is full of destruction. Because their, their throat is an open grave. They've got terrible, deadly breath is what they have. That's what he's saying. And they're bent on destroying God's kingdom. Notice how he uses in these verses the mouth and the throat and the tongue. That they speak evil. The interesting thing is that this passage is quoted in the New Testament, right? In Romans, remember in Romans chapter 3 that Paul goes on on his holy rant about how we are all under sin and that no one is righteous, no, not even one, and that every mouth will be silenced on the last day. And that we all deserve God's judgment. We all have this open cave syndrome or open grave syndrome. And that's why we need Jesus. And that's why we need a righteousness that's not our own, a righteousness that comes from God. As Paul goes right into that, right after that in Romans 3.21 and says, but now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus to all who believe. You know, we can look at the wicked until we realize that apart from God's grace, we are wicked. And we need a righteousness that covers us, a righteousness that comes from God, a righteousness that comes through trusting in Christ. But why isn't David praying for this righteousness? Why isn't David praying for what, what why, why, is he, why is he not praying for his enemies? Aren't we told to pray for our enemies? Why isn't he praying for the salvation of the wicked? Is David out of sync with God's heart? Is David, is David just Old Testament and uh, kind of immaturity on his part? Have to get to the New Testament to get to the good stuff? The bigger question is, can we ever pray a prayer like verse 10 and 11? We're told by Jesus to bless our enemies, Right? to pray for those who persecute us. We're to love even our enemies. How does this fit with that? And some have gone the way of saying, well, this doesn't fit, and just leave it out. These imprecatory cursings that we find in 25% of the 150 Psalms, you'll find some type of cursing of the wicked. 25%, 37, I counted it, 37 Psalms speak like this of the wicked and praying against the wicked. How does that fit with the ethics of our Lord? Well, I would say we can't throw it out. (laughs) It's God's Word. All Scripture is God-breathed, not just the Scripture that we can understand perfectly, not just the Scripture that makes us feel good, but all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is profitable in some way. And here's what the Lord has led me and considered as Christian. We pray for anyone and everyone to be saved. That's the New Testament ethic. That's the heart of God. Even though we don't know who will be saved. We pray for everyone to be saved because everyone, from our perspective, could be elect right? But we know that not not everyone is elect. 
We know that there are people who are never going to believe. And that's why we pray against evil. For that very same reason, because we just don't know who God is going to save and who God is not going to save. Let me give you a word that we don't usually talk about, but it's talked about in some reform circles, the word reprobate. Have you heard that word before? A reprobate. A reprobate is a person who will never come to Christ. A reprobate is a person who was lost and always will be lost, no matter how many times they hear the gospel. They will never believe. Now, we don't know who reprobates are because we don't know who's going to believe, right? But God knows, and this really exists. We don't know. So we pray for God to save everyone that we know, and yet we pray against the reprobate, that he would be declared guilty, that he would be banished from God's sight because of their many sins, because of his rebellion against a holy God. You see, when you think about it, the banishment of evil has to happen, we've been seeing this in these early Psalms, has to happen before God's people can be ultimately saved. Judgment's going to have to come before salvation can fully come to us. The judgment day is going to have to happen before the day of liberation comes for us. And that's just the fact of the way God is saving people of his will. Dale Ralph Davis is perfect on this. I will love him on this. And he says, does it make you uneasy to pray like this after verse 10 and 11? But you haven't any choice. For God's people cannot enjoy security and safety unless at some point the enemies are taken out of the way. We may wish prayer could be all courtesy and finesse. If so, we're, we've no business messing with the Psalms. Prayer must often have a hard edge about it because it has to deal with evil. There is a ruggedness about true biblical piety. Why is the psalmist so ecstatic over Yahweh's coming to judge the earth? Because it means that at that time, he will put things right. And only then can the cosmic party begin. I know this is hard, Christians, but I think it's biblical. Paul in 1 Corinthians 22 says, if anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. And then he says, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Maranatha, right after that statement, come Lord Jesus, come save your people. But a curse upon those who will not come, who will not love the Lord. You know, I watched a, a documentary this week, and we got go here, but uh, a, a documentary about this poor lady, the mother of one of the two boys of the Columbine shooting. You remember that in Colorado? Back in, when was that, in the 80s? Um, and she talks about her experience, very touching. And she says, I remember praying to the Lord when I heard that there was a standoff and that my son was involved and that people were being shot and I prayed, Lord, take him out of the way. If he's doing this, take him out of the way. Stop his life right now. That's an imprecatory prayer. That's a, a, a necessary prayer in an evil world. All right, finally, and more positively, let's move to verse 11 and 12 finally here. But, but this is the second contrast that, that, that uh, David makes. But let all who take refuge in God be glad on the opposite side of this. Those who come to the Lord for salvation have a different destiny. They have a different tone. They, have a, they sing a different song. They have so much. You and I have so much to be glad about, so much to, to rejoice in and to sing about. 
And it's if in this last couple of verses, David just gets it finally. David finally realizes that, that the righteous, it's not just turning, the righteous have all these, they're going to be saved from evil. That's what he gets, I think. It's almost, it's like a, a, a door opens up for David in these last couple of verses. And he sees the victory of all God's people, even with evil around him. He sees it. And he's no longer overcome by it. He is no longer overwhelmed by it. He knows it's going to be all right. It's, it's sort of a Romans 8 moment for David here. There's, there's no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He knows the lies of the evil will not prevail and that the, the forces of destruction will be destroyed. And, and why? Because God's favor is on his people. And that he t receives all who come to him and take refuge in him. This is what we've been seeing in these Psalms, isn't it? That God is a God like a shield. And here we come up to the shield again. That is a shield around the Christian. In fact, the very last Hebrew word of the Psalm is you will surround him, all in one word. You will surround him. That's what we're left with at the end. God will surround those who come and flee to him and take refuge in him. God will surely do this. Evil cannot get to you, Christian, ultimately. Evil will not overwhelm you. God's protection will. Think of what Jesus says. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Think of what Jesus said earlier in John. And this is the will of him who sent me, not the, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. You will be raised, Christian, on the last day. Think of Paul in Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Think of Jude 1, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Jesus will keep you, Christian. Or Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, God, Christ, he says, will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will do it, it says. Or in 2 Corinthians 1, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. It's guaranteed to you, Christian. You will make it to the end through all the evil. The church father, Tertullian, said, God forget, forbid that we should believe that the soul of any saint should be snuffed out by the devil. For what is of God is never extinguished. What is of God is never extinguished. You can't put it out. No one can put it out. God's light has come to you, Christian, and you'll be saved. Let me end with an illustration I've Told you this one before. Maybe you'll remember it. Maybe you won't. Hopefully you'll remember it after this. It's a true story about a guy by the name of Frederick Nolan. And he was fleeing from persecution in North Africa. And he was pursued hotly by his persecutors. And he had no place to hide. It was the desert. And he felt exhausted from running. And finally he stopped by a wayside small cave expecting his enemies to find him very soon as he hid in that cave. And then as he waited, he looked up and he saw a spider weaving a web. And within minutes, that little spider had made a web across the, surf, the, the entrance of that small hole, really what it was, that he crawled into. And he wondered at how it did. What a wonderful thing. And he waited for his his enemies to find him. And sure enough, they found the cave, but they deducted that he couldn't be in that cave because this beautiful web 
was not broken into or destroyed. And they left him, and he survived. And he burst out and exclaimed, where God is, a spider's web is like a wall. Where God is not, a wall is like a spider's web. Take that with you, with you Christian. God has his ways of saving his people. And I'm, I'm not promising an easy way of it from this point on <laughs> by any stretch of imagination. Death will be def- difficult to go through. Persecution may be ahead for us. We don't know what's ahead for us, but we know that God will protect us, that we've, flo- we've flown to him, we've run to him, we, we belong to him. He promises to keep us, and he will keep you, Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're standing alone. How, who can stand before the Lord? You need Jesus. You need the one who died for sinners to take away the sin of sinners, so they may enjoy the Lord all their lives. Come to this Christ today. Believe in this Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and you will be protected to the very end. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these wonderful promises. They're all through your word. It's not just Psalm 5. Of your greatness to save a people for yourself that come to you. Lord, help us as we wrestle with how to pray for evil, when to pray against it, when to not, when to pray, and how to pray. Lord, we know that you will hear those prayers and give us wisdom, and you will save us, and we'll be protected whether you use a spider's web or you use something else, we'll be able to see your hand one day as we look back and see how you have saved us. Oh, Lord, may we be encouraged today. May we be encouraged in the face of of much evil to not give up, to not be pessimistic, to not be cynical, to be like David in these last verses. You are going to save your people. We are filled with joy because of it. Lord, may we be filled with joy because of it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.